Yeah, it's kind of like, whatever. We just trying to uh, not have to deal with shit. And I damn sure don't want to have to deal with the third time. But am I equipped to do it a third time? Brings in another question. I am. I am equipped to do it the third time. Do I want to do it the third time? No. 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 Would I do things differently? Yes, the fuck I would. What would you do differently? I already done things differently because I told you my thought process was, but if my mother was to get shit, right? Mm -hmm. I can't. I can't do the things with my mother that I did with my father because it's just a man-woman situation at the end of the day. I'd go hard if I had to, but it's still a line. Yeah. Um, one main thing is I have sp uh, uh, explicit instructions from her as to what to do with her if she you know, gets this disease. I have account numbers. I have resources that's in place. I have all the information I need to make the decision that's necessary. And it's signed and notarized. All I have to do is just do it. Will it hurt? Yeah, it's your mom. Well, my mother also knows that she would be putting her son through that, her only child through that that's unwed doesn't have kids for a third time that's like worst enemy shit right <laughs>
I think it was the cleat version. <laughs> but they was wearing them in the street. Like, you know, we would wear, wear any other like tennis shoes. And I just stood, it just stood out to me. I was like, maybe that's some new fashion trend. We wear cleats now instead of wearing the actual tennis shoe. Mm -hmm. But um, it just always stood out to me. But they were fly though, man. They were fly. Uh, she wore them like cleats. Um, she wore the cleats all the time. But the colorway was just, I can't really remember the colorway, but I just remember it was 97s. And I remember they were cleats and I remember they were fly. Mm -hmm. She was able to dress them up, dress them down, you know. It was uh, ever since then I kind of been a fan of uh, Air Maxes specifically ninety sevens. But then the nineties came, you know, when I kind of you know got around to figuring out what the nineties were, mm -hmm. I was able to do more than nineties than I could do in the ninety sevens. Like ninety sevens, you put them on, you know, they they look fly, they look fly, fashionable, they match quite a you know bit of you know sweatsuits and stuff like that. But the nineties, I can go for a long walk in them, you know, you know after a while when they get kind of like used and abused they're like great like run out the house to the garage real quick <laughs> shoot run take the trash out shoes they slip they slide on easy come off easy comfortable man it just i just i'm just a fan of air maxes man but you know all the variations of air maxes are, are pretty decent shoes it's just those two stands out to me the most what are your expectancies of an everyday shoe durability um I need to be able to I need to be able I need to hold together because you know I do a lot I walk a lot I, I make a lot of moves um, so they have to be solid um, I need shoes to be comfortable because again same thing walking a lot I'm on my feet a lot um, uh, fashionable right a lot of my shoes I don't get too crazy with colors and shoes because I don't wear a lot of colors because you know, that's just not my style. Um, so I need shoes to kind of match multiple outfits at the same time, right? I don't want to, you know, you get like a shoe of like, let's just say pink and, and, and blue or something like that. Now I gotta go, in my head, I gotta find things that have like pink and blue in it to wear it. And it was like, yeah, but I'm gonna wear it every so often. It's kind of how these even came into play. But um, normally it's just shoes that kind of match multiple outfits, you know what I'm saying? So that's really most of what I look forward in, in shoes. For the work that you do, how important is presentation? <laughs> presentation is everything. We have to always present things 100% professional with a hundred percent of creativity even though you're probably not able to explore your creativity as much um to to get these products done um did this content done and things of that sort uh it's also about how it's about where it goes after you turn in you know your that presentation or that for me that piece of content do they stick around? Do the clients stick around? Because you did exceptional work. Um, does does this goes out? Does this go out to the world? And, and do you get referred by this person? Oh, by the person you work with? So across the board, just from the initial meeting, it's about presentation. And this is before I break out any cameras. This is before I do any edit, any chop, whatever. Just from that very beginning. The, the, the follow up email, how soon that comes after the initial meeting, you know, uh, how well you present yourself on the business side of things because you start dealing in the creative space, you know, people like to try to get over. So how well you present yourself as a, as a business minded person, you know, how professional you are, things like that. It's, 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 it's completely important. It's, it's increasing by the minute too as, as we're getting further into the world of content. How important is your follow-up game? Um, you gotta follow up uh, significantly. Uh, my follow-up game normally is pretty strong. 
um, 24 hours max uh, after the initial meeting. Uh, but recently it's been kind of falling off because I'm overloaded. And it's, it's kind of getting in that situation where I'm reeling myself back in um, to one, be more present in what I'm actually doing, what I'm actually working on. Uh, that allowing a lot of uh, outside influences kind of take my time the way I've allowed it to take my time. So I'm working on it to get back to where I used to be to my standard of what it should be. How important are work boundaries? It's definitely important because one thing, um, you don't want to have too much um, too much access when it comes to uh, you know in terms of like the work that you do and things of that sort. You don't have people kind of like feel like they can do whatever, put everything on you, and you got to kind of create that boundary. And that's just from a working standpoint. But when you start thinking about actually at work, uh, blending work with personal can get extremely difficult. Um, mainly because it, it could affect your bottom line, it could affect your money, it could affect the company, it could affect the brand, it can affect how you move forward professionally, it can, it can affect if you do move forward professionally. So it's, uh, you have to create boundaries, but I think creating strong boundaries in general and just sticking to them is very important. Uh, it's something that you know a lot of us have an issue with uh, when I say a lot of us I'm talking about myself <laughs> for real like we have an issue with because a lot of times you, you're with the people that you work with more than you're with probably your friends and family so you into their lives a lot more they into your lives a lot more um, and you really have to kind of go pretty hard to kind of just you know, be like, all right, we can only take it this far. I really, I really have an issue with people trying to say, like, you know, we work for a team, so I'm like, we're like a family. Like, no, we're not like a family. We work together. But then that creates, if you, if you vo like, pretty vocal about that, that can create other issues. So, I guess it all kind of depends on the team that you work on or work with. How do you overcome blurred lines at work? Ask questions. I just ask questions, man. Oh, uh, lines, lines tend to uh, get blurred often. You don't really know exactly what you're supposed to do in certain situations. Cause I used to guess at it. I used to figure like, hey, uh, I'm not 100% sure, but I'm gonna move in this direction. Whereas now, I'm like, if I if I don't, if I don't know, I'm asking. Uh, like, and, and we need to have a real conversation about it. Have you ever had a mentor in the production space? I had, had a few. Um, goes back to college. Uh, wasn't my professor. He was just the creative director of the university at the time. Uh, he's a professor now at the school. Uh, he was a mentor. Really taught me how to do a lot of things. Not just in the studio, but um, working, doing a video production independently. You know, from a business, from your own business, entrepreneurship standpoint, from a, a minimalist standpoint, whereas, you know, we kind of get the idea that we got to get all these big cameras and all these things, and he kind of really showed me how to do it, where I don't need all of that. And this is during the time before things, you know, you can get, like, more more bang for the buck. So, I mean, that minimalist style have taken me far because I don't need a lot when I go out to do things. It's just really about the final product. Um, back to presentation, right? So, um, also another mentor. Um, 
honestly, like, there's people that I work with, you know, just in general throughout different aspects of this. You know, I'm all, I'm like open book, I'm like always trying to learn something just because I may be a professional in this space or I, professional, or I feel like I professionalize something doesn't mean that I know everything. There's people that's always going to know something more than you do or something that you don't know. And I don't, again, I don't mind asking questions about stuff, absorbing game the way I can absorb it. So, yes, I have, I've had mentors. And also uh, another mentor, uh, Bill Vaughn, who really, uh, the, really, I mean, I, I met him off of, you know, when I used to try to do music, he, had, he was a recording studio owner, but he was into the whole production, live production thing, and uh, he really kind of gave me my start in, uh, in, in producing live events, um, the production teams for live events and stuff like that, and that's been going on ever since. Yes, the mentors. What are two pieces of advice a mentor gave you that went far? <clears throat> um, and I'm just trying to recall because they gave me a lot of game. But what I think the thing that I think two things that gave me the most. I know one for certain was uh, you don't need a lot to do a big job. That was, that's A1. I mean, one of the jobs, I took that, one of the jobs I did, I just shot everything on my iPhone. Um, I remember walking in and putting the iPhone on a $60 gimbal and people were kind of looking at me kind of crazy, but then when I submitted the final product, you would think I used a red camera. It was really just the app and a good iPhone. That was it. But um, that was, I kind of lived by that. And another one is, uh, you get it right the first time, if you can. If not, don't worry about it, do it better next time. I think like a lot of times, you know, well for one, you don't want to uh, half-ass things that you're doing. It's like if, if you want to kind of check at, check the boxes or, or as much things as you can when it comes down to what I do in production. Um, you got one shot at it because a lot of stuff I do is live. You can't tell somebody stop, cut, let's go back, let's do it again. No, you got one shot. Um, and if you you know you miss that shot or you miss that situation, um, that can be a big deal. But you can't cry with spilled milk if you did do it. So now you just gotta figure out how you're not gonna do it or have to repeat the same mistakes, the same mistake again. So it was a uh, it holds that holds pretty well. I mean, again, something I do every day. Yeah, I'm gonna need another one. I think this this thing falling apart. Thank you. Yes, sir. And by the way, this is amazing. I never really cleaned my shoes before. Welcome to the other side. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think with all the new technology that's come out with a lot of these cameras that a lot of folks don't do that clean of a job of working on their skill set. Yes. Um. There's a foundation for everything, right? Like one of the main, one of the main things, uh, you know, when, when you pick up a camera for the first time, and I'm, I'm gonna speak to like you doing it in a professional way, is that you got to know shot compositions. Um. A lot of people don't really know shot compositions because essentially um, wherever they, you know, where they plan to put their photo, where they plan to put their their video and stuff like that, the uh, aspect ratios are different. So they really don't know how they want to, you know, they really don't know how they want to shoot what they need to shoot, but they don't really think that, okay, let me go figure out the basis, medium shot, wide shot. Um, bus shot, close up, extreme close up, uh, rule of thirds. 
they just, they just don't care about any of that. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And, you know, especially when you start dealing with, like, the whole cell phone thing. It's taken away. I mean, they got, you know, internal stabilization. And the same thing with a lot of the mirrorless cameras. You know, so now you're taking away uh, an entire... Uh, almost an entire job from a person that's a professional camera op. <laughs> because those are things they spent, you know, 10, 15, 20 years, if not longer, mastering how to do it. And now technology come out and say, hey, we can do it better. I mean, there's lenses that allow you to get, you know, a certain depth of field. And now you can go into an app on the phone and press a button and it gives you that exact same depth of field. So you don't even really need to know. You don't know when it, on your iPhone it says one uh, uh, by one, by two, by three. You don't you don't really know that used to you. It's just zooming in. No, you're changing the depth of field. So it does make it it does make it a bit difficult. I mean, if you go to any at this point, if you go to uh, say if you go to like a basketball game, a professional basketball game, right? And you see somebody that's on the floor, you know, running around with a camera in there, a, 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 a iPhone or Android, even, but let's just say iPhone. And you just you, you know you just thinking like you know what is this person really doing? If you're thinking that, and then well essentially what this person is probably doing is grabbing like content that they're going to edit together on their phone, not even do linear editing with you know Adobe or DaVinci or something like that, where you know people spend X amount of dollars and spend X amount of years becoming masters at or becoming professional operators at, and they're gonna put it together and it's gonna go out to the world easily you know a couple of hundred thousand viewers on like a, a, a you know a couple of million follower page and you know if it's for their own page and look at the money that's gonna come did in their direction if it was the photog that went out there and did it um did all the same work passed it to the editor editor did it thing and you know it goes up that person may have made i don't know thousand dollars two thousand dollars the editor may have made one thousand dollars so it's three thousand dollars move for two people to do something that one person can do with a phone and make like ten thousand dollars I mean, it's kind of crazy how things are going right now in that space i think that space is starting to dry up uh in terms of like being like being someone that goes to school study Communications, but study just the foundation of the com of communications of media, uh, of make of mass media, and yeah, I think all the, I think them days are kind of rounded up right now. I think it's only going to be like news stations, but people mostly get their news from social media now too. So I think there were never enough jobs for all the people that were in school. It's not, and that's that's another important thing that's discussed. Well, not talked on enough. It's not. It's not. I mean, also, I come from an era where you're not told to do anything other than just go to school, get a degree. <laughs> it's not like let's look at the market. Let's see, <laughs> let's let's see what 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 where employment is trending, so you can, you know, actually find you know a real position, right? Because you know, I graduated um, high school right before 9/11. I graduated uh, June 2001. So what the world was, was go to school, get a degree, and you'll get a job. At least that's the way it was sold to me. I couldn't tell you, I can't confirm or deny if that's what it actually was, but that's what, how it was sold to me. Now, 11 comes, then boom, new industries, right? I mean, you're talking about not just military, but defense, everything, security, everything. IT, everything, technology. The basically a technology boom was not thinking that was going to be the case while I was in school. Cool. You know, I'm going to still stay my path. Um, then I graduate. Did a bit of an extended stay because I started uh, I started college late and I did a bit of an extended stay. Um, so I graduated December 2008 three weeks after the market crash in 2008. So, me fought staying my path and having these opportunities to, 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 you know, work for, you know, these different media companies and, and, you know, studios and stuff like that. 
without the window because the advertisers went first. So layoffs were happening left and right. So they had no intentions of returning to DC, but that happened and I was homebound. What state were you in when this all happened? Virginia. I was in Southern Virginia, though. I was like in the Virginia Beach area. Um, How bad did the market crash hit that area? Uh, it didn't hit it as hard as people as it hit other areas because Norfolk is mostly um, mostly uh, uh, known for uh, people work you know, defense contractors or military contractors because the naval base that's right there. But it's not just the naval base that's in Norfolk, but it's also Air Force Base in Virginia Beach. There's Army bases and stuff like that in the, yeah, across the water. Over the water. Yeah, so. Yeah, every morning. Right, so those jobs were still secure. But what I wanted to do, it was still an issue with, um, you know, the advertisers and stuff pulling out. Um, Cause that, cause that just wasn't the only place you know I applied to. It was a new station down there. It was also places in New York, and all of those went. Uh, and it was one place in uh, one uh, studio in California. And actually, that was the first one that said "Never mind." <laughs> so, at least that's the first email I saw that said "Never mind." So, it was back to DC from that point. And still, in the case, it probably didn't have to be back to DC, but it was better to try at that moment in time in my life. It was better than trying to figure it out in Norfolk, Virginia. I go back to DC and try to figure it out. At least then I don't have to pay <laughs> for lodging. <laughs> so that's how I looked at it at the time. How long does it take for you to get familiar with a new camera? Hmm. Depends on how often I use it. If I, uh, I mean, if, if, if it comes out the case and, you know, I was yet like, you know, Christmas morning or fresh from Toys R Us, you know, you go mess with the, the you go mess with the new toy for a little bit. Uh, I'll probably figure out the basics of it. It's really going to be just how I do auto functioning things um, but if I use it once then it's going to take me use it once a month then it's going to take me like three months if I'm using it quite often if I'm just outside just messing with the camera and things like that so it's probably going to take me about a month especially now because cameras have so many different aspects of them, um, so many different functionalities you want to kind of go through them all and see what works and, and under what circumstances does it work best um you know, but I also don't like to, and it's kind of crazy. It's like you don't like you get a new camera or you introduced to a new camera at your disposal, and you got shoots lined up. It's like I don't want to take the new one yet. Like I'm familiar with the old one, and you know, so I know its limitations. I know what I can do on it, and I'm not trying to waste nobody's time. I'm not trying to really waste my time because it goes all the way back to that presentation. If I go in there and I know exactly what I'm doing with the camera, setting it up and having it uh, ready for the shoot and all that stuff like that, they look at me all these guys professionally know what he's doing. If I go in there and I'm looking, trying to figure out what's the terminology, just to format the SD card, and I'm just sitting there staring at the LCD screen or whatever, <laughs> and then it becomes an issue because what happens is you can feel everybody eyes looking at you. The room actually gets a little bit warmer <laughs> when that happens. You try to figure something out on the camera. And so. But one thing is, especially in the space that I, I film in, I don't have a lot of time to, like, figure it out. Like, it, that becomes an issue. So, so I'll take the camera out um, when I get opportunity to, to kind of fool around with it on my own time, on my own terms. And if I'm able to do it often enough, maybe a month before I actually roll it out for anyone else, you know, for a project. Three important steps for breaking in a new camera. Um, I don't know about breaking in the camera, but I can tell you about understanding the camera. Uh, first thing is to let it run. 
See if it get hot or not. See how long the battery life is. Oh. Um, test the uh, 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 test the zoom options, right? It's like um, and a lot of uh, pro cameras, pro like uh, not DSLRs, but but uh, camcorders that have uh, zoom buttons, multiple zoom buttons. Um, test those. Find out which one can give you the the zoom speed that works for you. Um, that's important because again, if you're doing live recording, you don't want to do a too fast zoom. Um, and you don't want to do a slow zoom unless it calls for a slow zoom. But fast zooms are normally always unacceptable. Uh, another thing is, and I think the last thing in this in this situation is uh, see how high the see how how uh, how well the the frame rates when well, you shoot at a higher frame rate. See if that reduces either a your battery power uh, uh, more quickly and two it does um, also see check and see if the high frame rate comes in if you buy a 4k camera see if the high frame rate can shoot in the 4k uh, uh, format because a lot of times well not a lot of times but sometimes you can get a camera that can shoot to uh, 1920 by 1080 in 4k but can't shoot uh, 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 4k in well, can't shoot. Uh, no, let me rephrase that. You'll find a camera that can shoot um, 1920 at 24 frames, or 4K at 24 frames and at 30 frames, but can't shoot 24 frames um, in 4K. So check and see if all that kind of matches up, and you can get actually what you're paying your money for, because they're not even going to advertise that. You know, if they do, it's going to be in the small print. I I discovered that on a few uh, cameras recently. What frames? <clears throat> what frames do you think this interview is being shot in? Uh, it's hard to say, right? Because it could easily be twenty-four frames per second, but it also easily be sixty frames per second. Main camera, four K, twenty-four. B camera, four K, thirty. Why the difference in frames? Just the settings of the cameras. Yes, yeah, I like to kind of keep all my frame rates consistent. We that's a, that's a, my thing. Yeah, we wanted to, but this camera didn't yeah. have the same frame rate, so we yeah. just uh, got it in the middle, the sweet spot. Right. Like, guy, this works. Right. <clears throat> and they line up well in the interview when I do the the edits, which is most important. Yeah, true. Yeah, I like to keep my uh, frame rates consistent um, because I'm not doing most of the time when I'm when I'm doing st uh, editing or oh, shooting. Um, it's really just camera A, B, C, D type of situation. It's it's not like this camera is gonna be for slow mode. This camera is gonna be for this, that, the third. Like everything is gonna be across the board. It's gonna be just chopping in between. Kind of keeps the uh, timeline clean because um, one thing about the software that I use, if the Frame rates are, are different when you go into the timeline. Um, you can have like chopping in the timeline. So it, it just makes the process even more difficult to get through. Um, sometimes like, you know, the, the audio will go faster because the audio is being recorded kind of independently, but the audio will go through faster. The video will be slower. <laughs> it's just like, it becomes too much. So I tend to shoot at the same frame rate all the way around. Do you clean the bottom of your shoes or not? Yeah, but I use, I'll use that though. Okay. Did you want to switch it out for the other one to yeah. the sides and the tops on the other one? Yeah. Why not? So let's talk about dimension. Roger that. What are your thoughts? Sucks. Tell me more. It's unfair to the person that gets it, the the the, the patient of it. It's unfair to the family of that person. It is, in my opinion, the absolute worst disease because one, 
there's no cure. Number two, there's only one one way out of it. Number three, it creates a mental illness. It's a mental illness itself, but how it progresses, it can, <laughs> if you're a sane person, or, you know, and what you would consider to be a sane person, and you uh, and, and, and you're a, a caregiver of someone with that disease, you would literally feel like you're losing your mind because you're not changing your way of thinking based off of this person and their disease that's essentially is killing their brain, right? Um, it, it's, just, it's just, it's it's so unfair. Um, it's, it's unfair. And what does fair mean? No one even knows anymore, but is it, is it something that you would want this is something you would want to experience if someone told you like there's a chance that you know you'll start forgetting everything <laughs> that's close to you like the people that's close to you the the memories that you spent this lifetime you know building or you paying for because you know trips and stuff like that like all that's going to go to shit. like it's, it it will not exist anywhere other than on the photo that you won't even recognize Right, you will not remember your children's name. In fact, you won't even remember what your children look like. Might have some familiarity, but might not. You know, how do you how do you handle that? Because essentially, you get diagnosed with this while you're still in in a, a set where you you know what's going on, right? Because you only get diagnosed this around you know stage one, having the symptoms of it. And you get told, this is going to happen. There's no time period on how long it's going to be before it's completely gone. But it's going. Hey, it might not even go all the way, but who knows, right? But if it goes all the way, you're going to have to be cared for 24-7. Nothing's going to make sense <laughs> again. And then being the family member on the other end of that that conversation with the doctors, like my life is changing now because what you essentially just said was this person is going to learn, is going to forget how to do everything, not just forget who you are, but forget how to do everything, forget how to use the bathroom, forget how to eat, forget how to swallow. Forget how to stand up. Some cases forget how to walk. And who job is it to make sure this person is able to kind of get through all that? Shit? The family member. So it's unfair. The disease. In your experience with dementia. What do you think it's the biggest theft of? Time. Dementia, Alzheimer's, robs time. Time for you. Well, first, let's start with the person who has the, the disease, right? You spend a lifetime making memories. Lifetime. Probably spent a small fortune making that those memories too, right? Anything from vacations to you know, buying homes to you know cars, you know, just bu building your own life, building building your life, and it's you know in a series of stages, it all goes away. So you lose your you lose the memory of your life. So all that time is now gone and, and to that person essentially. It robs time to caregivers. Cause any plans you really had, you can't, you know, a lot a lot of the bigger plans now, you know, goes to the wayside. Oh. Uh, you know, you, you had thought of like, you know, I'm gonna go out here, you know, 
you know, start dating and getting married. Say if this is a younger person, um, dating, getting married, having kids, which all requires time. You don't have that time no more, especially if the person that has dementia or Alzheimer's, um, you know, have you know have more of an advanced stage of it. So it robs you from time. Period. That is the biggest stuff. Takes your life, man. <laughs> One of the most important things we have is our time and how to spend it. We talk about it all the time, right? We get, you hear it on social media. I got time today, <laughs> or I ain't got the time to deal with this, so on and so forth. We say it all. We say it often. So time is definitely one of the most important things. And then not to have time. Yeah, that's that's rough. Is there a difference between dementia versus Alzheimer's? Um dementia is just mainly just the uh the cognitive disease in terms of just, you know, forgetting um, uh, Alzheimer's is the is a graduated version of it. it was discovered by um, a guy named Alzheimer's. That's why it's called Alzheimer's disease. It's like a graduated version of it. Whereas, um, uh, the when you get to that stage, that's when you lose. If you get to Alzheimer's, everyone who gets dementia does not get Alzheimer's. They gotta make that perfectly clear. Um, some people can get dementia and just hold and just forget names. You know, but still could do everything else right. Uh, but when you start getting into Alzheimer's, that's when people start losing the ability to walk, they lose the ability to swallow. They have physical breakdowns. It's essentially the brain telling the body to stop. You know, like it can literally say, your heart can be in perfect working condition, but Alzheimer's can be like this, stop beating. <laughs> so, I mean, it's such a shitty disease. But that just also shows how powerful the brain is. Um, A lot of people that have Alzheimer's, they're not. They're normally under like 24 hours supervision and care. Um, they normally don't talk either. They only lose their ability to talk and communicate effectively. Dementia is more of, I'm lost where I'm at. <laughs> Alzheimer's is, Sitting in the chair, quiet, or just random, making random noises. So, I was one that experienced both in terms of caregiving. So I've seen the whole, the whole thing. Not easy to watch. Even worse to deal with. What would you say the toll is on the person who's experiencing it versus the person that's caregiving for the person that's experiencing it? It's hard to say in terms of the person that's uh, experiencing it because like with a lot of mental, mentally ill people, right? They don't know that they're really experiencing the mental illness. I always say this, you can go to a sane asylum and everyone that's in the straitjacket <laughs> believe they're the sanest person in the room. It's essentially the same thing. Um, they don't believe anything is wrong. They don't believe that they're seeing things differently. They do feel like they've been they've been getting confused on some things, but they feel like they like nothing is wrong with me. You're crazy. I'm not. But everyone else is like, nah. You know what I'm saying? Like you put the car in reverse to drive forward. Like this is happening. Like you know. Um, so it's hard to really say from their perspective. Um, but from and it's been very few things really written from that perspective 
Um, but I can say that from a caregiver standpoint, it's again, it's it's losing time, right? It's quick adjustment. See, we're used to having as as everyday humans, we're used to having our day or our week lined up. We like to be on routine. We have to be on routine for the most part. That's just how the world works. Have some type of routine. Thank you, sir. We gotta have some type of routine. If, you, if you're giving care to someone with dementia all the time, your routine will change on you in a heartbeat. I kind of had this conversation with my cousin. I had, was talking about how, you know, he can teach his daughter the ABCs. He can go from, she might not know the ABCs yet, so he's teaching it to her. He can go, well, today we're going to do A through D. And she'll eventually get A through D. Then we'll go through E to whatever, then whatever to whatever. Eventually making it to Z. And then she'll be able to say all 26 letters of the alphabet. Dealing with someone with dementia is they know all 26 letters of the alphabet. And we're good with that. And then this random Tuesday, they know 20 letters. All right, cool. We'll fill it in the other six. Then a random Sunday, they only know 14. Now you got to figure out which ones they don't know. And then you know, a few days later, you know, in hindsight, not 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 actuality, they don't know a, a letter, so it's working backwards, and and it happens so randomly. It's like you don't see it coming. Like literally, it's it's the next day. Something's changed. Something's different. And I got to figure this out all over again. I got to start at the very beginning and figure this out all over again. And what that do to you in your personal space, right? Especially someone who has to live their life by routine. It's horrible, man. Horrible. somebody support someone who's taking care of somebody with dementia there's multiple ways you can support someone um that has a, that that's a caregiver or someone with dementia alzheimer's right so first thing is give them a call from time to time you don't have to ask them how they feel don't even have to ask them you know uh, uh, how things have changed with the person that they're giving care to. Just have a basic conversation. Matter of fact, make them laugh. <laughs> you know, when you when they call them, act like I don't want to say act like that don't exist, but don't make that the focal point of the conversation, right? Um, it may go there later, but people need an escape. So, and 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 the escape is not getting out the house a lot of times. The escape is just that we. Is that having a conversation with an adult? <laughs> because when you're dealing with someone, especially if they if they're significantly significantly advanced in the disease, the conversations goes away, and you're literally talking to a, a, an adult like you're talking to a two year old or one year old, someone that has no grasp of the English language or whatever language you're speaking. Um, yeah, so, and that becomes day in, day out. So just being able to call someone and just have an adult conversation with them, if merely for a few minutes, right? That's an escape. That helps. Um, another thing people can do is you can offer to like, bring dinner to the house, you know, or something like that. You don't have to, you know, cook all you know cook a little big meal or something like that but give someone the opportunity to to take something off their plate for the day because if you're in the kitchen cook, say if you're someone that has like advanced dementia or, or alzheimer's and they're in the kitchen and they're cooking obviously they're not watching that person and that person is getting into something at this point right 
everyone's they're not just sitting there still rocking back and forth like we see in movies you know they they you know they're picking and pulling and reaching and putting stuff in their mouth just like you think about a child this is this happens right um you know sometimes one of a major thing is again if they advanced dementia or advanced alzheimer's or advanced dementia or alzheimer's stopping past the house if only for like 15 20 minutes you can just play some music or whatever have, just have uh just small interactions with the person that has the, the the disease to allow the caregiver and this is the caregivers by themselves with with, with caregiving to allow this person to be able to take a shower allow this person time just kind of go in the bathroom even though they need to cry for a second one of the biggest issues when you're trying to give care to someone with that disease when it's bad when it's advanced is that you can't leave them alone and you can't necessarily assume that it's always going to be help, uh, 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 medical help available. They can't even get away to take a shower. You know, you can't even get away to use the bathroom like how you need to use the bathroom. And a lot of these people that that give care, they're dealing with you know these people that use the bathroom themselves a lot. So they, <laughs> so you know, if your stomach can't handle it. Then <laughs> That's his old problem, but you're sitting there, you, you know, you're changing this adult and stuff like that, and you know, you, you know, you're doing a lot of the, the 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 a lot of the medical duties and stuff was on your own, and you can't even tend to yourself. That's a problem. So if you can help someone, just like, hey, look, I'm stop past the house twenty minutes. That twenty minutes will make a break. That person. <laughs> you know, it can make that it make that person have a great day. The part about the caregiver, or if you don't do it, it could be the the end result could be a very bad day for that person. So, but you, again, you know, pick your battles too. So you don't you know you don't always have to do that. That is not the only thing you can do, but that's definitely a huge point. Not being able to take a shower. When there's a perfectly good working shower right there and, and water bill is paid for, that's difficult. That is difficult. Are there ways people could educate themselves? The the best way to really educate yourself is by visiting um, Alzheimer's Association dot org, um, nonprofit, um, company that's really based around, well, nonprofit organization that's really based around dementia, Alzheimer's. Uh, they have a lot of information for uh, uh, people to advocate for research on the on the disease. Um, a lot of uh, resources for caregivers um, and it's not just they also have local resources available to you as well because they have chapters from different you know regions and things of that sort so there's a, there's a lot of uh, ways you can educate yourself on that um, you can actually find events that's happening where there's people that's trained to speak on dementia Alzheimer's, uh, Alzheimer's go to speak on dementia and Alzheimer's um, Because again, it's such a. I mean, you can read a, you can read a thousand books on it, scientific based books. You can read tons of books um, about uh, uh, people who had to, you know, be in the caregiving space, right? Um, but I think the I think Alzheimer's uh, I think the Alzheimer's Association. I think they pretty much have it simplified enough for you to get the direct information you need to one to know how to help with caregiving to if you have to transition to being the caregiver to preparing the loved one um, that has been diagnosed with the disease for the journey that they're getting ready to experience um, that's going to be you know individualized but there's resources available for at least how to just like talk to the person and, 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 and kind of stop setting up your life and setting up their life. There's resources on you setting up your life 
for you know essentially the long haul. Um, I think it's just, I think it's pretty dope. It helped me. Definitely helped me. It gave me resources when I was uh, kind of crashing and burning. What I like to say in my own journey. Uh, they had group therapy sessions. Um, at the time, it was it was during COVID, so they weren't in person. But uh, I think the biggest thing was being able to. Uh, I didn't really talk. I listened because um, the people that was on this thing were older, um, significantly older, mostly spouses or someone with it. Um, if they, if, you know, they. If they had a parent that had it and they were caregiving for a parent, a lot of them they were spouses. They had spouses, spousal support. Um, so I was just listening, and, but it was kind of good to hear people was going through the same thing. And I know that kind of sounds rough, but you really feel like you're on the island when you when you caregiver. And I guess hearing the stories like this, uh, I'm not alone. Or this happens for other people too. And that helped. Kind of grim in nature, but it helped. experience life is way shorter than we think uh, for me dealing with it I mean my journey with it starts in, 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 in I was a teenager and my grandmother had dementia it didn't get it didn't advance too much but that's my my first real understand oh my first time really seeing it then my father gets and he goes the whole length of it um he gets it around, how old was he, like 67, 66. He, he dies when he is 80. <laughs> you know, those 13 or 14 years, <laughs> mostly off the books in his head. So essentially his life ended when he was, you know, in his late 60s. So. Oh, it started to end when he was in his late 60s. So life is way shorter. And the thing is, people are getting it younger now. So we always kind of credit it to being an old person's disease. Oh, you got to be old before you get that. Like, nah, nah. As the science is advancing and finding out that a lot of people are getting it from traumatic brain injuries. Um, that just being in traumatic situations where the brain is affected. And it's getting younger. And, I mean, you know. So you, I mean, you can run across now. It's not, it's not uncommon to hear about the fifty-year-old uh, in stage one. Will they go all the way through? Maybe, maybe not, right? But just to, to be diagnosed with it means there's going to be significant changes in your life and your family's life. Uh, so life is way shorter than we think it is because you don't have the end road. The end result is death. That's the end result. It's not like cancer, and, and, and as shitty as cancer is, it's not like cancer where there still might be a shot. They might remove the cancer. Yes, the cancer could come back, but there's still a shot that could be removed. Now, once you get this shit, you got that shit. And no one knows how it's going to move through your brain. It, they just, they'll just know when it happens. So you can't even plan for it. There was a movie, I think Tyler Perry did it. Um... Uh, where the 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 character uh, got diagnosed with dementia, so they decided to do a road trip, wanted to kind of do a bucket list type of thing um, before they lose all the memories and stuff like that. Yeah, that don't happen. I'm not saying everybody don't do it because who knows, right? But yeah, that doesn't seem like a situation because, like, I remember the movie. She was writing notes and putting them on the mirror and stuff like that, and so she can remember certain things every time she woke up. Or, you know, she feel like something slipping, she has uh, uh, something written. But guess what? At some point, you're not going to be able to read words. <laughs> so, and it's going to happen at any given moment. You know, you know so, you, yeah, life is way shorter than you think it is. And to elaborate on that, I come out of college, I'm only home. You know, try and get my life together, try and get back on my feet, trying to actually get to New York. Uh, 
then my father gets diagnosed for real. Uh, the the diagno the pre diagnosis he had, it didn't really. I mean, you know, we didn't see any real differences in him and things like that. So, but when we start noticing the real change, that's when, you know, he kind of we took the diagnosis more serious. You know, took him back to the doctor. They ran the test and like, yeah, this is happening. Um, and how that took my life away from me for you know 13 years. You know, and it's funny because I thought that when I opened this, well, <laughs> like, you know, sometimes you think like, uh, what, what's the first thing I'm going to really say? What's the first thing I'm going to say on this platform or or being in the, be in the, the position where I can actually, like, talk about it freely? What's the first thing I was going to say? And I came up being theatric, <laughs> theatrical <laughs> shit. I came up with this, like, this little line. It was like, you know, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a husband. I'm not a father. The most important title I've ever had was son. And I thought it was so profound because it's so real. But that's exactly what it was, though. Been 13 years doing what I had to do or what I felt like I had to do. As someone who's looking to help those in that community, what are your concerns? In which community? dimension and Alzheimer's community in terms of the people that got it or the people that's kid that's giving care to someone that has it the folks who are giving care to someone that has it um again you know <clears throat> uh well for one if you know someone that's giving um care to, to someone that's, that has dementia or Alzheimer's um, I guess you could say it's kind of a cliche, but be there, like be there to support them and, and the way they need to be supported. If if you really care for that person <laughs> that's going through this, um, I've had people, and it's just, it's just the ignorance and the fact that I was young, right? That just did not understand the gravity of what I was going through, and. It was like he's over there with it. You know what I'm saying? Like, no, I need to. I, I need to have a basic conversation, a basic adult conversation with another adult. It's not. It's not a whole bunch of stops and no's all day long. You know, that's getting progressively worse as the the weeks you know continue. Um, again, uh, another thing. You don't have to go and try to support it. I mean, read it. You know, one of the, you know the thing. I think this would grinds a lot of people gears that's dealing with this directly is when and again I'm, I'm speaking from a person who had to deal with it you know in their 20s and their 30s when people when you talk about it and then people say yeah my grandmother had it <laughs> you know my grandfather had it it sucked yes but that is by far not the thing to say to someone that's dealing with it every day because I, I assure you, you were, you were not the one dealing with it every day with your grandparents. You show up to grandparents' house. And I mean, everyone's situation is different, but this is me assuming, and this is based off of me having these conversations with these people because I did entertain them. You show up to your grandparents' house once a month, maybe, Hi, Grandma. How are you doing? I'm your granddaughter. I'm your grandson. Walk out the room. Love you. Walk out the room. And you back in your life. Whoever's dealing with it is dealing with it. From sun up to sundown. And again, sun up to sundown. So, when you talk to me about your grandfather had it, 
And I asked you what's the and I asked you was like so like what like what are you doing in terms of your you know giving care to your grandfather or whatever the case was, and I you say like you know you you know you sit with them while they ate or something like that. You just talk to them, you play music and they put a smile on their face, they clap their hands and things like that. Those that's great. I'm glad that's happening for you, right? But when I but if you asked me that same question and I was like. Well, I took my 78-year-old father to clean his ass because he's everywhere. You know, as I'm doing that, he's just pissing on the floor. <laughs> so now I got to finish that. To finish that. I got to clean up him peeing on the floor. Or oh, whatever thing they had to do. Oh, well, he was eating and he started choking and couldn't breathe. I had to give him a Heimlich maneuver. You know what I'm saying? Like... If I wasn't there, he'd be dead from choking on Jello. So don't try to relate your experiences with someone else's experience if you're not a direct caregiver. Because what you're essentially going to do is make the person mad. Inside, they probably, they probably won't show it to you directly, but it will be a situation where they'll roll their eyes <laughs> and be like, yeah, you, don't, you ain't doing nothing. As someone who's seen this play out in their family twice, do you have concerns for yourself? No. Because I, I know how that happened for them. And I mean, it's been determined, so it's not like me guessing at it or whatever. Um, I don't have a concern with my, my grandmother. I don't have a concern because it was based on her medical history. The, 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 the medicines and stuff that was given her at the time it caused an uh, adverse effect, and that was kind of the way it played out it didn't get deep for her but it did it you know it got a little she's talking to pictures type of thing right like i'll go in the room it'll be a baby picture of me and a baby picture of my little cousin and it's cracker crumbs around the picture and you're like grandma why the cracker crumbs right there it's like i was feeding little greg and little tia he's like grandma you can't feed pictures right or she'll sit there and talk to the pictures like we're really there that's not Rough at the time, but now going through what I went through with my father, not nowhere near as bad. Uh, my father had a traumatic brain injury. He was in a car accident. Uh, an 18-wheeler hit him on the highway, flipped him over about like seven, eight times or something. Um, never really bounced back from that. He walked away from the from the accident without a scratch on him physically, but the damage, I mean, your brain's not supposed to rattle like that in your head getting hit on the highway door, however many miles per hour by an uh, 18 wheeler. You know, they found him in a ditch, but he was in the car. Luckily, he was driving the car that he was driving, whereas the, the roof didn't collapse. Um, so he actually was able to walk away from the accident, but something was left on 495 that night. And he never came back. Never came with him. But it was a slow progress since then too. But that was just, that was where it started. So I don't have any, you know, if if I, you know, don't find myself on that medicine that my grandmother was on that gave her the adverse effect. Or if I don't get into a situation where I have a traumatic brain injury, then no, I, I don't have any effects. I mean, I have, I have no thoughts of you know that being like my outcome. Um, but that took me to find these things out. Right, because the information on how people get the get diagnosed with dementia or get, or get the dementia or get Alzheimer's is so thin that you start believing anything that's told to you. You know, people start thinking it's like diabetes is hereditary, right? It's like sometimes, yeah, we can say diabetes are hereditary, but let me see your diet. Like, how are you helping that, right? And, you know, and you can say the same thing for the disease that we're talking about. Uh, they say diet could play a big effect in that, but they don't know what part of the diet. <laughs> because you got people that's, you know, that, that doesn't eat like, you know, high fat and foods and things like that. So eat a lot of fish that, you know, is still getting it. 
but they say the die can play an effect. So I mean, anything, no one knows, right? So I think people also better off not thinking about it too, because until there's direct, you know, acknowledgement to how someone can get it, then I think we're all in the position where we could get it, but we just don't know what we're doing or what we're not doing to prevent it. So or to get it. It's so such a young such a young disease for it to not be a young disease. I guess the research is young. But let me answer that question again too. Cause there's a flip side to that. Although I don't have that thought in my head that I would get it based off of the information that I have of how my family did get it. I still think about what if I do. I also think now, you know, only surviving members of my family now is myself and my mother. And um, I also think that what if my mother gets it? Can I go through this again for essentially a third time? That part freaks me the f out. You can bleep that out, but that, that freaks me the fuck out. Can I do this again for the third time? And not just that. Say one day I do get married or whatever and got in-laws and stuff like that and they get it. Can I do this? A third time, especially in a situation that I could walk away from. That is so fucked up to say, but that's so real. Can I do this again for the third time? Guess we'll see. What if my spouse get it? What if my wife get it? They get me younger now. What if you get it? Can I walk away from this? Should I walk away from this? I did vows. I'm not going to walk away from this. But can I do this the third time? I think that's a fair question. Yeah. Everyone has their limit. Trust me, we make a lot of vows in our average life, and when reality meets you, it lets you know who you actually are, and there's nothing wrong with that. But how would that be received, though? You know what I'm saying? It's like sickness of health, the death do you part. Mm -hmm. You're like, yeah, but don't get shit, though. <laughs> See, get that shit. I might be out the door. <laughs> I can't do that again. That shit was horrible. You know, or do we like do we come up with like some special plan for you know? It, deeper than that. Deeper than that. What if I get it? And I have you know our kids. Do I? Do I before I you know before you know this this may even be a thing. Like do I initially go in the game like with the kids like look. Everything is set aside, and here's our, here are our instructions. If I get this shit, mm -hmm. get rid of my ass. Do not do what I did. Do not give yourself up the way I gave myself up. You know? Peeling back another layer. Well, if I don't have kids and get it, then what I do? Who's going to watch after me? Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Who's going to make sure that I'm cared for because again once they really start taking effect i don't know I'm, i don't know if anything is wrong with me mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying and trust is out the window at that point right you don't know who the people are anyway exactly yeah exactly so there's a lot of levels of thinking when it comes to to what happens if i have to if it happens to me or if I have to go through it for a third time with someone else, 
It's a lot of thoughts come up with that, especially with the numbers increasing the way they're increasing. And still no cure in sight that we know of. And no real treatment even. I mean, they, they give they give people to slow them down, but we, we know about the pharmaceutical industry, right? So, yeah. <laughs> so we, yeah, it's kind of like, whatever. We just trying to uh, not have to deal with this shit. And that damn sure don't want to have to deal with the third time. But am I equipped to do it a third time? Brings in another question. I am. I am equipped to do it the third time. Do I want to do it the third time? Nah. No. Nah. Would I do things differently? Yes, the fuck I would. What would you do differently? I already done things differently because I told you my thought process was what if my mother was to get this shit, right? Mm -hmm. I can't I can't do the things with my mother that I did with my father. Because it's just a man woman situation at the end of the day. I'll go hard if I had to, but it's still a line. Yeah. Um, one main thing is I have sp uh, uh, explicit instructions from her as to what to do with her if she, you know, gets this disease. I have account numbers, I have resources that's in place. I have all the information I need to make the decision that's necessary. And it's signed and notarized. All I have to do is just do it. Will it hurt? F yeah, it's your mom. Well, my mother also knows that she would be putting her son through that, her only child through that, that's unwed, doesn't have kids. For a third time. That's like worst enemy shit, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What's what is it like living with that fear? Oh um, that's that that's that's a that's a wild question to me. Cause I don't know what it's like to not live with that fear. I mean, I was a kid, you know. Um, I always been a part of my life at this point, so I don't know what I don't know what that's like. Oh, um, let me see if I can kind of reach a little bit, cause I'm sure it's something there. Make you pick wisely in terms of dating. You have to pick because you know that you know, like going back to saying like, what if you have parents that do it right? I need to know if, when I'm dating, I need to know how well you can operate in a crisis situation. Yeah. What does that look like? What does that look like? Yeah. I have dated people who have had breakdowns over something so minor because it didn't go their way. Right. And that's fine. I'm not judging you for that because, you know, your life is your life. The things that you go through that you believe is tough, you know, are things that you go through that you believe is tough. I don't have to wear that. Um, I am big on how do you deal with a crisis situation? I'm also big on how healthy are your parents? You know, you know, if you, especially if you're only child, like where are we with that? Like. You know, how are you managing if you have older parents, how are you how are you managing dealing with older parents, right? You know, are you used to having hard conversations with your older parents, whereas you know they're having harder conversations with older black people or just older people in general. Things are real taboo, you're not gonna get a lot of information out of them. Um one of the biggest issues is not having all the information before the memory went. So now you gotta kinda piece shit together and try to find shit and try to make sense of things that really doesn't make sense. Um, so what is your relationship like with your peoples, right? What's your relationship like with other family members? Do you have a tribe? People that's gonna, you know, support you because those are things and, and it's funny to you because this actually had got brought up a while ago. That's what that's that's kind of why I kinda leaned into it just now, right after I thought about it for a minute. Um, is the fact that 
people, you know, they 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 looking for, you know, you know, you know, aspirations, the ambition, the money, you know, because you need some money. Let's just be honest. They looking at, you know, all these optical things. It's the optics. It's it's it's, it's you know, the brand. Or can we sell to the public? Well, I'm put on social media type shit, right? You know, and I'm looking at dating and relationships like, nigga. Are you able to are you able to to help me if I'm up? Are you able to help anybody if you fucked up that you love, right? Because old age is a thing. Sickness is a thing. And if you can't handle basic shit, then we really don't have a lot to talk about. So what you think right and 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 not saying that you know they don't grow from the things and i don't allow them a chance to understand that um i want to make sure you know i'm clear with that point because you know i don't like the whole mistakes old people head again like if you if you tripping over a situation that's minor and i'm looking at it like that's small shit though that's that's me i'm not gonna project my shit onto you um at least i try not to but if you learn from that, you like, oh yeah, that was mine or whatever. And you know, things get tougher in life and shit like that. And you learn to handle things with more, I guess, precision. I think the word I want to use. Um, I don't want to necessarily say grace because come on, right? <laughs> like you're going to stumble, but you know, you're, you're real, you know, you're real decisive about how you're moving in, 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 a, in a, you know, fucked up situation. Then, all right, I can work with that. Learn from, learn from and grow and because it's only going to get heavier. So, but that's a huge thing, man. That's that's really a huge thing. How do you operate in a crisis situation? Keep your fucking cool <coughs> and adapt? Or do you just fuck, fuck out? <laughs> Be like... That really does define who you are. Yeah. Like, because that means that this is what you go to when things hit the fan every time. This, if you're dealing with someone with this disease, this is what you're gonna go through every day. Yeah. Are you gonna fall out every day? Mm -hmm. Three o'clock in the morning, my mother come knock. I live in my parents' house. Three o'clock in the morning, my mother knocking my door. Your father's gone. Did he take the GPS tracker with him? And this is before GPS is what GPS is now. Mm -hmm. So updated every 10 minutes. No so, air tags, no nothing. None of that. Yeah. It's, a G it's just a GPS that we threw on this keychain. It was big and bulky. <laughs> Did he take that with him? Yeah. He took it, but it's not updating or it's not charged because mm -hmm. you had to charge him individually. Mm -hmm. um, we plan for this. Yeah. And three o'clock, well, I'm freak out because I can't find him three o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. And we in, you know, some of the worst neighborhoods in Southeast yeah. DC. And you gotta just calmly keep yourself together. And what's going? What you think happens if you're? Yeah, right. You gotta yeah. calmly keep yourself together. You also gotta be real mindful of where you're at. What's gonna happen when dudes is on the corner doing whatever three o'clock, four o'clock in the morning? Mm -hmm. See your car drive around the block twice. Mm -hmm. Now you become a target. Or Who the hell is this? Or there's no OGs around to keep everybody calm and be like, nah, that's a real situation. Exactly. Whereas we, you know, we've been short on OGs for a long time. Uh, so, yeah, you have to really be <laughs> real strategic in how you move. Mm -hmm. Real strategic in how you, uh, real calm, especially when you get faced with these individuals. You know, man, who, who you know? You know what I'm saying? You gotta... You gotta very short, very clear, very direct. Mm -hmm. My father is lost. He's on GPS. And I'm looking for him. Your father's lost. Yes, my father is lost. Why is he lost? He got Alzheimer's. You just go ahead and cut out dementia. Just say Alzheimer's. Most people don't even really know what dementia is. Yeah. You so you say Alzheimer's. You kind of know what Alzheimer's is, even before he was even really diagnosed with Alzheimer's. Like he got Alzheimer's. He's lost. He's in this area yeah. somewhere. Yeah. Hey man, you making our block hot? Look, you see, you know, old guys just running around. You know, I'll be back around a little bit later. Let me know. You know what I'm saying? You, you gotta play it real, and you can't real. To lose your calm. 
you cannot afford to lose your con. You can't afford to lose your con when police are involved. Yeah. You know, you got to talk to the police a certain way. I mean, it's across the board. We know that by yeah. just you know still, what it is now. Yeah. When there's a loved one on the line, it's very different. It's very different. It's like, look, he's not he's not crazy. He has this. I am his such and such. He is being belligerent right now because he's confused. Mm -hmm. I am here. I will take him with me. Yeah. And which was crazy because my father was former law enforcement. And they were going through his pockets, you know, they you know, they pat people down. They were doing it illegally a lot of times because he's not giving no damn consent. How could he? Mm -hmm. They still going in his damn pockets and shit, checking to see what he got, looking for drugs, thinking he on something. Because, you know, th there's no sick black person protocol <laughs> that they follow, sick old person protocol that they follow in the street. It's either you want drugs or you whatever. Anyway, you go through shit. They see he had a retirement badge. They see the badge. Did it change certain situations? Yes. You know, but he still, you know, would get, you know, I guess to get him off the street type of thing. You know, they'll they'll take him to the priest. They won't put him in the jail, but they did take him to the to, to, to the psychiatric hospital. With them folks. With them folks and was getting ready to process them in until my mother got there. So yeah. it was a uh, wish in case was uh, I think a police officer um, outside of routine let my mother know that this they got him and they got him down there. If she if he never got that call, he would have got processed. Mm -hmm. And the next time we would have heard anything about him was probably been days later. It was about him being in the damn loony bin. And you know. It gets real hard when people get put in that system. Yes. Because now you have another label that's mm -hmm. added on to what you're already dealing with and somebody with Alzheimer's and dementia. Yeah, see, you know, I mean, early early reports of, of this disease was schizophrenia. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, that's how they treated it and they still kind of treat it as such. And, like, there's no policy or anything like that that's really strong and upfront that's saying, look, this is what this is how you treat the you know people with this and and, and luckily you know my father had a family mm -hmm. he had me and my mother there's people out here that don't have anybody yeah I mean we like I said we 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 see silver alerts all the damn time they don't have nobody and how does the the, the city how does you know different uh, governments treat this you know they don't they don't treat it yeah throw them in the Institution, throw them in. Well, throw them in the system. Period. Mm -hmm. Throw them in the system. And you get lost in the system. And you get lost in the system. Now you have a mental illness, but your heart beats well, blood flows through your veins well. You don't have any other ailment. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So you can literally be in the system. It's 25, 30 years. Lost. Lost. Confused. Don't know what the hell is going on day to day. Your mind will kill you because before your body will. Yeah. Fucked up. Fucked up. We not doing shit about it even. Fucked up. Yeah, I'm gonna need the uh the link, Amazon link to these. I got that TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> Whenever I find it, I got you. Exactly. <clears throat> was going to say um, let's end this off on one more question yes sir with everything you know now about how this disease is not being handled in your experience with loved ones what's one thing you would tell someone who's new to being a caregiver in this space Take care of yourself. Number one, see somebody. Get your, your therapist, group session, somebody. You have got to have professional, someone professional to help talk you through what you're feeling and what you're thinking. Um, it just does. I mean, you'll lose yourself in the process going through this, right? You 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 won't do your hobbies no more. You won't go out like that anymore. Friends go another direction. You'll sit in the house and you'll be looking at life happen while on social media. You know, people having kids, people having 
uh, uh, you know, marriage and people taking big trips. You know, you do, you'll do, you see all these things happening on social media and it's not happening for you because you can't. But that doesn't mean that, you know, you have to kind of put yourself in this cocoon. So definitely seek help. Take care of yourself. Mental health first, right? Second, physical health. You will spend a lot of time, at first, you'll spend a lot of time chasing this person around. They, they real active, right? Just like a child, right? But eventually, they're going to need help standing up sitting down bathroom especially if it's a woman right so they gonna so you're gonna have to be able to lift them up and sit them down often so focus on your physical health um you can do find exercises you can do around the house you can do it wherever you got this person sitting there you got this person sitting in the living room you can find exercises you can do right there in the living room but focus on your physical health because that's going to be very important. Diet, that's the third thing because you, you don't have a lot of time to prepare food, uh, food a lot of times. So you might you know, end up eating out a lot. You know, Obviously, when you start doing that, then you're going to have your own health issues. So um, focus on your diet if you can. You know? I mean, that's going to be hit or miss for a lot of people depending on where you live. You know, some people live in food deserts and things of that sort. But if you can... Just focus on your diet. Um, shoot, so many things you can do, man. Um, get the paperwork, man. Get the paperwork done. All right. So first thing, get all the get all the account numbers. You don't need to know what's in the account. But get all the account numbers. Find all the life insurance papers, the health insurance papers, if you already don't know it, right? Um, you know, get a will done. If their will hasn't been done, get a will. Um, a lot of times with the black family, a will hasn't been done. Um, if you're, you know, get a will done, get things notarized, right? Um, you can do a power of attorney because eventually you're going to be the person that's going to say, you know, it's going to speak for this person. So get that power of attorney. Like, get all this done early while they still have it in their mind that they can speak for themselves and they can write their name on a piece of paper. Because it gets exceptionally difficult once they can't anymore. And it can be used against you in court. Um, another thing. Uh, sit your family members down. If you're not one that's um, an only child like myself, or well, my, I was my mother's only, uh, we'll get into that later, <laughs> but if, if if you're not in this situation that's the only child or, or just as, as the spouse, and, and there's no children involved or whatever, but there there's just a whole family, just, you know, four kids or something like that, sit everyone down, and you know, for one, let them know what's happening. Yeah, you're gonna get it's gonna be freak out bonus, um, cool, but let everybody in on what's happening and let every and let everyone in on how things are gonna move, you know, here on out. Um, at least until things get essentially bad you've got to have this conversation again but it got to be based on what that situation looks like at that point in time I think the biggest thing here though there's kind of just you know if you the biggest advice though is just you know, talk to someone early on of how you know have someone in your corner you know, a therapist you know have someone in your corner that you can call and you can say, hey, this is what I'm feeling. Because if you don't talk through your, through, your, through your emotions and things like that, you'll just bottle all that shit up. And what's essentially is going to happen is this person is going to make you exceptionally mad. You're going to get infuriated, especially if you have problems, you know, existing problems with this person. Because, you know, we all have our issues with other people. Um, to some degree, uh, uh, you know, some are heavier than others. Some of them might just be minor. But there's always been some level of disagreement or some type of like, yeah, I don't really like that. But if it's major and and now you face the face with this person in this, in this situation, this person says something that super triggers you or does something that super triggers you, and you will get super mad and they think they don't even realize. That this is happening and because the emotions the brain is, is playing on the emotions 
this person might cuss you out and then smile at you. And you will be so pissed off that you want to hit this person. And a lot of times, this happens. This happens. Elder abuse is a real thing. And a lot of times, when you find out why, why this happened, you'll find out this person got dementia. So, have someone to talk to. Work out your shit. So you won't take out your shit on them, even if they're the cause of your shit. Yeah. This is a day in my shoes.